My name is Ron Heifetz, and I've been teaching at the Kennedy School at Harvard for 35 years. I founded the Center for Public Leadership here. And I've been experimenting with teaching leadership uh, for all of this time. I call it an experiment because even though my courses have been quite successful and I've had students now uh, go practice leadership all around the world, some have become presidents and prime ministers of countries, many are working at grassroots, a lot are working in schools or religious organizations, nonprofits, governments of, any, of all kind and in business. Um, I continue, continue to call it an experiment because leadership itself is a frontier area of thought. It's not a well-worked discipline where people agree on basic terms of reference as you'd find in economics or, or health or medicine or law or, or statistics or engineering. People even disagree when you read books on leadership about how they define the terms leadership, authority, management, power, influence, follower, citizen. So a lot of my work has been at the frontier to clarify uh, useful ways to understand these different words and what they mean, and then to build a theory, a practical theory of leadership to guide people in their daily practice. So one of the big discoveries in my work is that, is that we tend to over-identify leadership with a set of personal characteristics. There is no one set of personal characteristics that is leadership. All the ones that we would say are important in leadership, like the ability to listen, to stomach ambiguity, to stomach conflict, to keep uh, purposes and values uh, ever present in your mind. Those are important to be a good parent. To be a good parent of a teenager, you've got to have a stomach for conflict. You've got to be willing to improvise and try different things out. You've got to keep your eye on the ball of what you're trying to accomplish, even when you're exhausted and tired and, and sometimes quite annoyed. So there is no one set of characteristics or char personal abilities that define leadership. Leadership is defined by the work to be done, the challenges that people are facing. Like in any craft, a good carpenter may have good tools and good abilities, but what makes a carpenter a carpenter is that they build houses and so forth. So we don't really need leadership in a society or in an organization when the problems are routine and we know what to do. What we need people to do is provide the kind of managerial and authoritative expertise um, and the know-how to define the problem to be solved and mobilize people and organize people uh, and direct people towards a solution. We need leadership in societies and organizations when people are facing new kinds of challenges that require people to learn new ways. And that challenge then of learning new ways is a discovery process which sometimes is quite painful because sometimes to learn new ways you've got to unlearn old ways. And that sometimes means departing from tradition and departing from history. So leadership in its practice can sometimes be quite dangerous and risky work because you're trying to engage people in facing up to realities that require departures from historical traditions and, and other ways of operating and sometimes requires people to move to the frontier of their competence to experiment in an area where they can't feel entirely competent yet because those new competencies are yet to be developed. And developing that kind of stomach to orchestrate and mobilize and listen to people and hold people through an, an, a, an ongoing process of developing new capacity. I would say that that begins to describe the heart of the practice of leadership. And in that sense, the heart of the practice of leadership is an educative process. You're trying to help people come to new judgments to clarify their value orientations, to clarify how to relate to one another properly and uh, how to uh, distribute power differently, um, and how to experiment and move from version 1.1 to 1.2 and have a stomach for ongoing failure as they move towards increasingly productive uh, successes. That kind of leadership is, uh, is, I think, begins to anchor leadership in the work to be done rather than simply the personal skills or the powers of authority. So leadership then becomes accessible to anybody. One might exercise leadership from a high position of authority, but one might also exercise leadership from the middle of an organization or at the front lines. Because if we begin to distinguish leadership from authority, then it's, it's a practice that anybody can participate in simply by seeing a problem in your midst and beginning to mobilize people in your surrounding to work on that problem and build that new capacity. 
And that becomes very important because then we can begin to uh, counteract the tendency of people to wait until they gain a high position of authority to practice leadership. Indeed, if you're working in a school, you can practice leadership as, an, as, a, as, a, as a novice teacher because you may be bringing fresh ideas to it in a school where many other teachers may be a little bit calloused and a little bit exhausted, but you have new experiments to run. Now, if you know how to listen carefully and respect your elders and then engage them quite gradually in a process of reawakening some of their own adventuresomeness and plasticity, you may actually help build the capacity of that school even from the position of a new person like somebody from Teach for America. And similarly, you might practice leadership as the chairman of the English department in mobilizing and mentoring teachers both lateral to you and, and new and even some senior teachers in trying out new things and rediscovering uh, how to have fun in the classroom or in um, softening the calluses that emerge because teachers of course fail with a percentage of their students every day and it becomes hard to face into those failures and stay in the game. So that one could be practicing leadership as a chair of a department, not just a novice teacher, in uh, helping people continue the ongoing adventure of discovering how to work that frontier of competence in finding ways to connect to that student whose eyes tend to glaze over. Maybe they glaze over because they saw a fight at home the night before. Maybe because, you know, an uncle touched them in a way that was abusive. And then the teacher has to somehow learn skills of social work, new kinds of competencies, visiting homes, bringing in an uncle into the classroom, uh, into a parent-teacher meeting, in order to figure out what are the needs of that student to hold that student properly to help that student fulfill his or her potential. And similarly, the principal of a school can practice leadership in all sorts of ways, including these. So distinguishing leadership from authority helps us begin to see that if we understand leadership as a practice, as an activity, then it becomes available to anybody, uh, high or low, any place they're positioned, simply because they passionately care about some problem situation, about the people in that problem situation, and then mobilize people with faith in their capacity to step up to the plate and meet that challenge.